Marishka Hargate. Marishka Hargate. Hi there, my name's Rachel. I'm here at Shift Fitness and I would love to share with you the pose of the day. It is twisting chair or Parvita Ukatasana. It's super beneficial for stretching the back, chest, hips, strengthening the core, the legs, and super fun and detoxing. So to begin, inhale, arms come up, and as you exhale, bring your feet together, bend your knees as if you were sitting in a chair. Tuck your tailbone under, and take a look. You should be able to see all ten toes. Inhale, getting long, and as you exhale, sink even deeper. Feel this in the quads, and bring your hands to heart center. As you begin to twist, start from the waist, moving into the chest, and eventually the head and neck. The palms will stack at the sternum, and gaze comes over the right shoulder. Don't forget to breathe. Come up, inhaling. Moving to the other side. Again, feet together, engage your core, bend your knees, and sink down. Tuck in the tailbone, hands come to heart center, and begin twisting from the waist, shoulders, and as you exhale, get even heavier in the hips. You can stay here for as long as you like. Or come up, inhale. Thank you. Namaste. The proper pronunciation, as we show here, will allow you to figure out some of the other ones as you look through the text. And so it's important when approaching uh, this language to so just get a feel for it first as, a, as an oral reality. Get a feel for how it resonates in your throat, in your body. Be playful with it. Don't, don't, uh, you know, don't worry about memorizing the letters or the transliteration quite yet, but just really understand how to properly sound these letters and from there you can go on to uh, many different aspects of the language and you know there's a lot of esoteric functions with different marma points and how these these sounds produce their powerful effects if you've read our introduction to the language you'll know uh, what a deep and living language sanskrit is and its importance its base uh, as really the foundation of all of india's great sciences and um, you know, spiritual disciplines. It's it's really this language, so it's it's important as a practitioner or as anyone interested in this subject to at least get a handle on, on the language itself. And so when we start approaching the language, we begin with the vowels, and the vowels are these primordial sounds of the language. They're they're easy to reproduce as they generally involve just a open throat to make these sounds. So you'll see a little diagram here and uh, we won't use it too much for the vowels because it's mainly just keeping an open throat and pronouncing these sounds is all that's required and they're really natural. They're the sounds that babies tend to make. So the first vowel that we have is shown as an A in transliteration but it's really an U uh sound in the word but so uh 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 so th this comes up in the word sanskrit itself which is not most people and even practitioners long time practitioners it's so ingrained in us that we just say sanskrit but it's really sanskrit and you'll see this time and time again so just get a feel for that first uh sound and the short uh sound is extended into uh, uh, so uh, and uh, are the first two letters of the alphabet. From there, we go on to the second set of letters, and these are shown as an I in the transliteration. The first is the short I sound, E, E, E. So really, it's more of that E sound in the in in English, but it's shown as an I here, and this gets extended into E, E. So those first four letters again are a, uh, a, uh, e, e. And from there, we have what is shown as U in the transliteration, but U, U. 
which gets once again the longer version, which is ooh, ooh. And then after these uh, initial uh, vowels, we have a, a, a couple characters which are not so much in use anymore. They, they will come up occasionally, but very rarely. And really their uh, proper usage and pronunciation has, has somewhat been lost over time. So these are here more as a reference, and uh, they'll come up again in different sounds in our, in our semi-vowels, but uh, it's important to know about them as you will see them. So the first one is uh, our sound, which is and so th this uh, this sound is made as far as how I, I've learned t by taking the tip of the tongue and pointing it towards the roof of the mouth and without the without quite touching the roof of the mouth and then trying to pronounce that R sound so and this once again gets extended into that long R sound so and you'll there will be some variations uh, you might see on this in different depending on the uh, dialect or region of India. So this might be pronounced as a, with an I, as in or 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 with a U, as in ru. Um, so just be aware of that. Uh, it may come up for you. And the second uh, uncommon uh, vowel is the L sound, which is made by taking the tongue right behind the teeth and uh, trying to pronounce L. So this sounds like And then once again, this is extended into long L. And as you pronounce these, you know, you'll, you'll feel a certain resonance in the back of the throat. So just be aware of that coming. And from there, we come to the uh, combined vowels sounds. So these are when we take those initial uh, uh, e, e, u, u, and put them together um, into uh, different uh, combinations. And this gives us a, a second set of vowels that uh, are used quite frequently. And the first set is where we can find the uh and the e sound. And we have a, a. And so while this is shown as an e in the transliteration, trans it's actually sounds more like an a in the English language. And the next uh, combined vowel we have is when we take the long uh, uh and e sound to make i. I. The third is when we take a uh, and u to make o, o. And the final is the long a uh, and u to make ow, ow. And then from there, we have two sounds that are generally grouped with the vowels, but are not vowels proper. And this is the m sound. So this can be added to uh, any vowel. So uh, generally, we add a, a sound here just so, uh, as we're learning it. But you can add i, a, any, any of these sounds to the m sound. So when pronounced, it's um. Um, and this is called an anusvara. And then we also have what's called the visarga, and this is a, a shown as H in this transliteration. And this this sound uh, tells us to repeat whatever vowels attached to it. So if we have the A uh, attached to it, it's aha, aha. If it was a, a the e sound, e, e sound, it would be Padmasana. We're going to start Padmasana. First of all, 
you sit with your legs straight and that's the normal sitting posture in yoga and then when we fold the right leg on top of left and then you fold the other leg on top of the other and then you sit in Gyan Mudra like this. Oh. This is Padmasana. It's very good for the flexibility of your legs. It tones up your legs and your lower back gives the strength to your back side, to your front side, all the internal organs into your stomach region. Namaskar. Our heels are touching. Move the flesh of your sit bone just like you would in Dandasana. We're going to start to pull some energy up through the pelvic floor. Nice flat lower back, lower ribs in. We're going to melt the shoulders down the back. And we're going to pick up our right leg. We're going to cradle it into our chest. So from the front. You take the shin and your calf, you loop your right arm underneath of the knee, and then you hug it into your body. If that's not accessible, then you can also take the right arm and just bring it around the leg. The sole of your right foot is pressing firmly against your left bicep, and it is flexed. From here, melt the shoulders down your back, lift your sternum and your heart, and breathe. We're going to start rocking the cradle. We're going to take that knee towards the wall behind us, all the while keeping your heart lifted until you're able to bring your foot forward, knee backwards, pull in the lower ribs, use your obliques, to then lift that leg over top of the shoulder. So from here you have your nice strong foundation, lots of core muscle, use your pelvic floor and then press your right hand into the floor. You can release your right foot because it's your leg that's squeezing onto the arm that keeps you balanced. From here, bring your left hand down to the floor, activate your hands, activate your fingertips, and then lift up through your belly. So you lift, maybe it's first just that, the hips that come off the ground, so from the side, just to build your core. We're lifting just the hips, Heart's coming forward, gaze is going forward. And then from there, pressing into the floor. From there, you lift your hips and then you lift your left ankle. Both legs are strongly activated. Elbows are facing backwards and then you can just start to point the toes. So that is your Eka Hasta Bhujasana. Um, takes a lot of time. If you can't get your hips and your ankle off the floor, then just take turns, just practice lifting up just the sit bones and leave the foot on the floor. Also, if you have blocks handy, that is really helpful. So a couple of blocks for underneath your arms will really help you isolate your core and then find that lift. Very important.